How to know if a graph is correctly drawn? Are all the aesthetic properties preserved? To answer these questions, we currently use quantitative methods that require graph structure and are computationally expensive. We propose a new method that to directly compute these metrics from graph layout images using convolutional neural networks. Below are the results. To know more about our approach, please attend our talk. Usual collaborative systems propose a public and private environments the latest possessing visibility rights. Subjective views are special objects perceived differently per user. However, a break in the social space may happen during exploration. Our visualization context tries to link efficiently multiple relative visualizations together around a common object. We discussed about the designs of a stacking layout, virtual leaking layout, and a mix between them. Kirigami is a rich, complex Japanese tradition of paper cutting. We leverage Kirigami to create new physical data representation and simple interaction. This is an example which shows global warming in five countries. The expansion shows mean temperature in each country in 1962. The user can manipulate the model by adding measure weights, and the increased expansion shows the mean temperature in 2012. Data journalists are a compelling group through which to study data wrangling because they frequently publish their methods to sites such as GitHub. In Table Scraps, we perform a qualitative study of their codes and computational notebooks to better understand the needs and pain points of journalists while data wrangling. From this data, we produce two taxonomies of computational journalism and a framework for multi-table data wrangling, and demonstrate these contributions through two case studies. We propose a novel visual analytics system for optimizing bus networks. The system helps users first analyze bus network performance and identify problematic routes. Then, the alternative to a selected routes can be obtained in real time. By evaluating these routes with our system, the users can efficiently decide which one is the best and improve the bus network. Virtualizations don't have to be static. In fact, sometimes it is the virtualization that is static, and the viewer is moving. And sometimes, both of them move. We present a first design space of virtualizations in motion. An implementation of this design space. And we are working on a user study. As word clouds grow bigger and words get pushed into the periphery, viewers are less able to accurately compare data, font size for example, associated with each word. This indicates that large distances between words detract from a reader's ability to extract data from the word cloud, but that this bias goes away with the longer periods of reader perusal, suggesting perusal time being an important consideration for design.
When doing the cell division for an embryo, plant biologists use several tools to get segmented 3D data set and build the hierarchy chain manually by traversing and analyzing neighboring cells and deciding on which neighbor is the sister based on their knowledge. In this poster, we present an interactive system for biologists to help with analyzing the development of plant embryo. Capturing analytic provenance is important for refining sense-making analysis. However, understanding this provenance can be difficult in distributed collaborations. We present a novel concept, crowd auditing, as a way to help debug distributed sense-making. We implemented the concept in a system called CrowdTrace that visualizes and traces the analysis provenance and elicit feedback to improve the analysis. We present an investigation into design judgment in DataViz practice. Our findings show how different types of judgments influence design decision making. Our findings also show that judgments occur in complex and layered ways while designers move through their process. We discuss implications for future research and pedagogy. Typically, black hole visualization takes a lot of compute time, but we achieve a quite faithful reproduction at interactive rates on a standard computer. For this, we make use of a novel adaptive grid approach to focus calculations where needed. Coupled with filtering and interpolation methods, we can obtain high quality imagery. Our approach accepts star catalogs and environment maps and generates the resulting deformations in real time. This paper explores the efficacy of using narratives as a medium of explaining the causality in causal networks. Now, towards this end, we provide you a glimpse of CauseWorks, a causality visualization system for generating narratives given a set of interventions and objectives for a causal model. And we further validate CauseWorks through interviews with experts. Please read our paper to know more. Thank you. Welcome to this session um, on, ex on supporting experts. Uh, my name is Matthew Berger. I'm with Vanderbilt University. Today we have uh, six interesting talks that span a diverse, diverse set of problem domains. Um, so we'll get started. So the first presentation in this session is titled Shuttle Space, Exploring and Analyzing Movement Trajectory in Immersive Visualization 
and it'll be presented by Shunyan Ye. Hello, everyone. I'm Shunyan from Zhejiang University. Today, I'm honored to present our work, Shadow Space, Exploring and Analyzing Movement Trajectory in Immersive Visualization. Badminton is an extremely popular indoor sport. There are more than 200 million active participants all around the world. When it first appeared in the Olympic Games, more than 1 billion people turned in to watch this on television. The movement trajectories in badminton, such as the ball trajectory and the player movements, are key concerns for sports analytics. These data contain variable insights, not only show what but how the tactics are used and reflect player performance. In recent years, various research have involved trajectory visual analytics. This includes analyzing the player and ball movement with 2D mode, understand the movement patterns and visualize 3D trajectory with a third-person 3D mode. However, only designing the visualization in these two modes might not be enough to fully present the insights behind the trajectory in badminton. First, the height dimension cannot be ignored. For instance, although the trajectories of these two techniques, clear and smash, are obviously different, their 2D projections are the same. Therefore, we need to demonstrate these movement data in three dimension. Second, third-person 3D mode is not enough to perceive player situation. For example, how does this type of trajectory cause difficulties for opposing players? Thus, we need a first-person perspective to improve the understanding of the player. Given the emergency of VR techniques, virtual reality has been increasingly used over the last several years. VR provides two unique benefits. It can present the 3D representation in a real 3D form which is particularly suitable for visualizing 3D trajectory data. And it is able to simulate the real court in an immersive environment, which allows the analysis to see and feel the 3D trajectories from the player's perspective. Therefore, these rise us to the motivation, how to support 3D badminton trajectory analysis from a player's perspective. To address the problem, two challenges need to be concerned. First, how to seamlessly visualize the 3D data together with 2D information from first-person perspective. The data visualization should be carefully designed to combine without hindering the perceptual effectiveness. Second, how to select badminton trajectory effectively and naturally in VR. An expert typically queries a specific part of strokes. However, selecting trajectories in a first-person perspective could be fatigue since the trajectories cannot be moved, rotate, and scaled. Moreover, the searching condition can be complex and indescribable. For example, how to select the strokes that swings in a certain direction at a certain speed. In this study, we propose shuttle space, an immersive system that enables domain experts to analyze badminton strokes through interactively exploring the trajectories from a player's perspective. To address the challenges, we have collaborated with domain experts with national team experience over the past year. By following the iteratively designed process, we summarized five design goals and developed the shuttle space accordingly. The first part is to visualize the data from a first-person perspective. Specifically, a stroke is visualized as two kinds of trajectories, namely a ballist trajectory for the shuttle and arrow trajectories for the players. We reconstruct the shuttle trajectory by aerodynamic model. We leverage virtual reality to fulfill the design, as VR offers the ability to simulate the reality, allowing the experts to see and feel the data and situation from the player's perspective. The next goal is allowing multi-granularity analysis of trajectory data. 
For hundreds of strokes, experts often cluster them into categories to identify the patterns and finally analyze the individual strokes. Therefore, a virtual summary of the trajectory data is necessary. Shadow space use a hierarchical DB scan to group the trajectories based on their spatial features. By doing this, shadow space is able to reduce the virtual clutter and keep the information of key points as much as possible. Second, I'll introduce the integration of 3D and 2D information. During analysis, experts aim to explore the relationship between trajectory and statistical data. For example, they need to understand how the usage and winning rate change with the highs of the highest point of the trajectories. To support this, we design Donut View to review these relationships on overall levels to show the statistics of all strokes in one category, and Grid View to show the detailed relationships between each single stroke and the statistic information. The Donut View presents usage and winning rate of all strokes in different categories in real time. User can select each segment of Donut to highlight the corresponding trajectory for easing the visualization. When examining each stroke in a category, we present grid view to review the relationships between the rate and the corresponding trajectory. In this example, we use two grid-based visualizations on both sides to visualize the distribution of rates along the vertical position. Shadow space also supports exploring the player trajectory. Through a polar coordinate on the ground, user can focus on distances between the start and end of the player's trajectory. The design of these views mainly incorporates three considerations. Legible to the user whenever he is in the simulated court, occlusion-free with regard to the trajectories, and with high bandwidth by leveraging the wide field of view of VR as much as possible. To fulfill the legibility, we place Donut View in the screen space instead of the world space. Thus, Donut View follows the user's movement and always appears within the user's field of view. For the other two considerations, we propose to leverage the peripheral version. A key observation is that the trajectory are usually located within the macula when the user observed them. Therefore, the peripheral version allows the user to perceive charts in parallel with the trajectories. Shadow space also supports comparison by reusing the design of donut and grid view. Specifically, the color of the sector in the donut represents the trajectory it donates. To compare at a detail level, each row of the grid is divided into two sub-rows for comparison. Finally, I'll introduce the natural embodied selection. In order to provide natural selection for the trajectories, we design virtual stroke, a metaphorical interaction that allows the users to select trajectories by waving the controller in a way similar to stroking. The target trajectories are then selected based on the simulation of the user's stroke. During the cooperation, we observed that our domain experts can easily use stroke to specify trajectories, which inspired our design. Such metaphorical interaction fulfills all our three design considerations and has many benefits, such as it's intuitive because the learning curve is gentle for the experts, it's feasible such that it can be easily performed by the experts, and it's also expressive since it's sufficient for the experts to select the trajectories they want. After stroke interaction, the st controller can obtain the heat position and velocity. Shuttle space then selects the target by simulating a virtual shuttle trajectory based on the aerodynamic model, and finally retrieve the trajectories which are most similar to it. However, the controller is quite different from a real racket, which caused our expert hardly swing it as fast as players. To mitigate this mismatch, 
we use a neural network to connect the stroke speed of the controller. For more details, please refer to our paper. Next, I'm going to introduce one of our case studies to demonstrate the usability of our system. In this case, an expert explored the lob strokes of a player to find his weakness. Donut chart shows that yellow category is the most frequently used strokes, but it has a low winning rate. The expert thinks this would be a weakness of this player. Therefore, he chose this category and used stroke action to filter the main trajectories of it for detailed analysis. First, the experts find out that in most cases, the player moves from the mid-right side to the front-left side. Previous techniques shows that such strokes are used to handle net shot and cross cut net shot. Then, by observing the shot point, experts notice that players tend to stroke the shot off low and near the net. Finally, he switched to the opponent's position to study how to prepare for such strokes. He discovers that most of the return points are close to the back right side of the court. Sector grid view indicates that the opponent's running is mostly within 4 meters. Moreover, according to the grid view, the player is more likely to lose the rally if the opponent returns the shuttle with a higher place. With this evidence, the experts conclude, after using the net shot to force this player to perform such kind of strokes, we should move back to the court and prepare to return to the shuttle at a higher place. The experts were quite satisfied with our system and list three advantages. They also provide some suggestions for the improvement of the system. To conclude, we contribute shuttle space, an immersive virtual analytics system for analyzing trajectory data in badminton from a first-person perspective. In the future, we would like to extend it from offline to online to meet more diverse analytics scenarios. Finally, we would like to thank all reviewers for their constructive comments and the following founding agencies for their generous support. Thanks for your listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Shunan, for the interesting talk. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions. Um, so first question is, um, wondering if you could clarify the advantages of the heads-up displays and whether you think that perhaps um, embedding the views within the virtual world itself would have any advantages. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, I think the head-up display, or one of the advantages of head-up display is that the user can use such a uh, device to immerse him or herself in the virtual world that uh, which is can simulate the virtual code in 3D and visualize the trajectories in 3D. And uh, 3D trajectories is uh, essential, essential for experts to uh, explore and analyze uh, and reasoning why such uh, why the player uh, win or lose the game with such trajectories. And the head up display also prof, uh, provided the user uh, not only the 3D world, but also the screen, uh, screen uh, world, which is that we can put the chart on the screen space. And the next question is uh, the advantages to put the chart in virtual world is that is, is the next question. Uh, I think, well, I think the advantage, advantages to put the uh, chart, such as the donut chart or the grid-based chart in the virtual world uh, will not overcome the disadvantages because in the 3D world, the expert may, uh, the user may suffer from the uh, perspective, uh, 3D perspective problem which is, means that if the chart is far, uh, far away from the user, uh, it, it appears smaller and it may cause some 
uh, problems to uh, exceed such charts. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. All right. So we'll move along to the uh, next presentation in our session. So the next talk is titled Q Lens Visual Analytics of Multi Step Problem Solving Behaviors for Improving Question Design. And the talk will be given by Meng Jia. Science and technology. First, let's see an example of multi step question. The question requires students to drag five characters to a queue to fulfill four conditions. These newly designed questions require students to construct a solution that fulfills a series of conditions by conducting multi step interactions. To guarantee the high quality of such learning materials, question designers need to inspect how students' problem-solving processes unfold step-by-step step to infer their problem-solving logic, engagement level, and difficulties encountered. And then they can know whether students' behaviors match their design intent and what kinds of guidance should be offered. Some work about game realization is similar to our work. They realize the states in the game based on position, and our previous work last year used the transition graph to demonstrate how students pass through each region of interest. Another work used the Sankey diagram to show how students pass through the cases in the programming exercises. This work either cannot reflect students' thinking logic or not scalable to support analytical tasks like comparison. In this work, we present a visual analytics system, QLens, to help question designers inspect, analyze, and compare problem-solving trajectories in order to distill insights for design improvements. We followed a user-centered design process by holding regular meetings with four domain experts, including two question designers, one system developer, and one project manager from an education company, to extract their requirements. Here are four main requirements show students' overall problem-solving performance, summarize and present the multi-step problem-solving behaviors, enable the comparison of students from different groups, and evaluate the feasibility of providing feedback based on existing data. Here is the system overview. It contains four modules, data pre-processing, data analysis, visualization, and interaction. In the data pre-processing module, we collected the mouse movement data when students solved the question. It contains the X, Y position and the mouse event on each timestamp. For each question, we first extract the regions of interest by drawing bounding boxes around all graphical components. Then, we number the region of interest as 1, 2, 3, with an order from the top left to the bottom right. For each student, we generate a region of interest sequence by checking whether each mouse position lies inside one of the region of interest. We then recover the intermediate answer sequence. For example, here, the students first drag mark to the last position. In the data analysis module, we use state transition to model students' problem-solving processes in multi-step questions. Step is the smallest user interface interaction that changes the intermediate answers. Stage is the number of conditions the current answer fulfills. Condition is one criteria that students need to fulfill to get the partial score. In the example, the student first drag mark to the last position, and he fulfills no condition, so he stays at stage 0. And then on step 2, the student drags poor to the first position, and he fulfills the first condition. Mark stands ahead of poor, so he moves on to stage 1. In the visualization module, we use a glyph embedded Sankey diagram to show how a group of students solve the question. The x-axis represents number of steps. A student makes a step when he or she changes the answer. Y-axis represents the number of stages. A student moves to a stage when he or she fulfills a certain number of conditions. We use a glyph to represent students' performance on a state. The number of rectangles represents the number of conditions. The color represents how many students fulfill a condition, and the width represents how many students reach a state. The transition lines between the glyphs show the number of students going from one state to another. We also use a dual axis to show students' average time and trajectory length on each step to indicate their engagement level. The step stage constitutes the first level of the state. The intermediate answer students feel would be showing when hover on the glyph. 
This data constitutes the second level of the state and would be used when calculating the data-driven recommended path. The transition view introduced above is the main view of our system. In fact, QLens has two other views. Overview, which shows the overall distribution of students' performance. Comparison view compares the problem-solving behaviors among two or more groups. Now we describe how our system can help question designers check the gap between problem-solving behavior and design intention. Still this question, students are required to drag five characters to the queue in order to satisfy four conditions. The question designer wants students to solve the question from the last condition. No boy is next to another boy. Based on this, students can solve the problem with the least steps. To verify whether students match the design intention, the question designer inspects the transition view. He finds that all the condition glyphs on stage 1 have a darker shade in the first rectangle. On the stage 2, most glyphs have darker shade on the first three rectangles and white in the fourth rectangle. This pattern implies that it is difficult for students to come up with the idea to start from the last condition. Therefore, the design intention, cultivating the reverse thinking ability, is not matched with students' problem-solving behavior here. Let's see another example. In this question, students are required to use all the digits to make two three-digit numbers whose product is the largest possible. From the solution provided by the question designer, they explain in detail 4 should be put behind 5 instead of 6, since they expect students may have trouble there. From the transition view, we indeed see a thick line on stage 2. From the glyphs on stage 2, we find that the first and third rectangles are all dark, while others are almost white. This indicates that students know where to put 6 and 5, but cannot fulfill more conditions to put 4 into the correct position, as expected by the question designer. This example shows that the design intention matches with students' problem-solving behaviors. The second case describes how question designers compare the problem-solving behaviors of different groups of students to determine the suitable groups for the current question. This question asks students to arrange all these cards to make one number is twice as big as the other number. For this given question, the designers promote to fix the highest and lowest digits first. They compare students from grade 2 and grade 7. By inspecting the condition glyphs of grade 7, they find the 1st, 4th, 5th, and 7th rectangles become darker, from the bottom to the top gradually. Particularly at stage 4, as highlighted by the red circle, students got the four conditions correct. However, students from grade 2 has no such pattern. From the contextual line chart, we find students from grade 7 took more time to think while students from grade 2 drag without thinking. Thus, question designers think that this question may be too difficult for lower grade students, since they could not catch up with the design intention. In the third case, we want to evaluate the feasibility of evidence-based feedback. This case describes how question designers check whether existing data is sufficient to provide evidence-based passes. From common error panel, they find four most common errors. For the first common error, the system can generate the high-quality recommended path, as shown in figure B. However, for the third error, very few people overcome based on existing data. The displayed recommended path has a lot of ups and downs which was not good and cannot be used as a direct feedback. Therefore, by using QLens, the question designers conclude that current data is not sufficient to provide data-driven, evidence-based passes for all the errors. We conducted case studies with four domain experts during the development. And we also conducted semi-structured interviews with another three domain experts, two question designers from a different educational company and one senior manager. Each interview lasts about 1.5 hours. We first introduce our system and introduce the three cases. Then we ask them to free explore the system and ask questions in terms of system usability and the usefulness. Overall, all experts confirmed the usefulness and the intuitiveness of the system. Here are the selected feedback. They think the insights from transition view will be very useful for the question designer and the system developer. And it is so clear to view the problem-solving process using the realization like the transition view. 
However, they also give some suggestions. For example, as more and more learning activities conducted online, it was also very helpful to compare students from different schools. And they also said that the on-the-fly guidance is what we expected but needs more considerations. Our works can be generalized to other event sequence analysis. For example, the video game behavior analysis for the game design, or online shopping behavior analysis for the product recommendation. In conclusion, we present an interactive visual analytic system on multi-step problem-solving behavior analysis to help educators and question designers evaluate question designs. We introduce a novel glyph embedded Sankey diagram to represent such behaviors in terms of problem-solving logic, engagement level, and difficulties encountered. We also conducted three case studies and interviews with domain experts to provide support for the usefulness and effectiveness of QLens. We also have done many other works on using visual analytics to enhance online learning. Here is the website. Welcome for communication and collaboration. Thank you very much. Any questions are welcome. Thank you, Meng, for the interesting talk. Um, so we have time for several questions. So um, one question I have is, um, so I was wondering if there are other forms of user interactions that you could log that would be helpful to better understand the behavior of students? OK, so currently we use uh, mouse movements. And we are considering in the future that we may incorporate the uh, video, uh, but not the interactions on the website, maybe the video recording to uh, extract the facial expressions and also maybe audio utterance to combine them together to do a uh, multimodal analysis of students' learning behavior. Yeah. So another question. Um, so this was largely targeted at um, lower grade students. I was wondering how this type of, whether the visualization design that you've come up with would extend to, um, so higher grade students, junior high, high school level students, or do you think mm -hmm. that those types of, you know, more advanced problems would require different approaches to your design? Uh, so uh, currently this kind of designs, uh, the target user is for the question designers. So uh, I think the designs for uh, different kinds of uh, students, uh, the design can maintain the similar ones. Uh, but uh, in the future, if you want to provide on-the-fly guidance to students, if the visualization are designed for students, we may considering, uh, we may need to consider uh, the complex complexity, and also we may tailor the information step by step and offer them to. Uh, different target users. Yes, thank you. Um, so, and one last question. So, um, it's it was really interesting to see the the feedback from the um, the experts. But I was wondering, um, because your visualization design is relatively um, involved and has multiple views and they're linked together, did mm -hmm. um, was there a good amount of training time involved to make sure that the experts understood the interface, or were was it were they able to easily um, dive in and understand what it could represent? Uh, so uh, it, uh, I, for the expert interview, and uh, I spent like 15 minutes to introduce the system. And also uh, I like around 20 minutes to introduce the different cases. So after the introducing, uh, they have already got the idea of how the realization uh, represents and uh, uh, how the system works. So it uh, there is no uh, not too much difficulty for them to use the system. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Um, okay. And so moving along, we'll I'll move on to our next presentation. So the next talk is titled uh, Visilant. 
visual support for the exploration and analytical process tracking in criminal investigations. And the talk will be um, given by Christina Zakapatan. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our talk about Visaland, a tool for visual support for the exploration and analytical process tracking in criminal investigations. My name is Kristina Zakopčenová, and I'm a PhD student at Masaryk University in Brno. And on behalf of my co-authors from our university and University of Bergen, I'm happy to present to you our work. Let's jump right in. Nowadays, visualization techniques are commonly used during investigations. In our research project, we worked with a team of criminalists from police of Czech Republic and analyzed their daily work to find potential areas for improvements. We followed a user-driven design approach to help us identify their needs and iteratively develop and test our designs. Overall, we detected two areas that required extra attention. The network visualization design and interactions adjusted for criminal investigation domain and externalization of the exploration process. This talk will be separated into these two parts and we will present to you how Visaland addresses both of these areas. First, let's have a look at the network visualization design and interactions in the context of criminal investigations. Criminalists commonly use network visualization to analyze relationships in data, and this often plays the central part of the whole investigation. In our collaboration, among the common requirements on the network visualization, we identified two that are specific to criminalists. Efficient organization of objects and relationships into different semantic groups and consideration of varying data credibility. The efficient organization of objects is necessary as the criminal data exhibits numerous patterns. It is important for investigators to have the possibility to reflect these in the analysis. Therefore, we propose three types of aggregations which have distinct visual representation. A typical pattern is a criminal who acts under multiple identities. So we support alias aggregation to see the change in network and relationships when investigator needs to substitute multiple objects by one. Another common pattern is a hierarchy. For instance, when a group of criminals is led by a single person and we can consider all acts of the group as acts of the boss. That's omitting unnecessary details. We call such aggregation a bundle in which the boss is the proxy to the other data. The third type of aggregation is a general group showing some commonalities, such a group of victims. In our tool, created aggregations are listed in the sidebar where users can study their details, annotate them, aggregate or disaggregate them, or minimize their notes. Let's have a look at our solutions. The second requirement is related to varying data credibility. Information about the credibility of data plays key role in investigations. Criminalists commonly use four times four metrics, which provides information about the trustworthiness of a source and information itself. And it is provided during data insertion into the data storage. However, as the central database contains only verified information and cannot bear unproven ones, Criminalists need means to insert data that is in a state of an assumption or with insufficient proof directly to the tool. Therefore, we propose three levels of data credibility, evidence, knowledge and assumption. And these are assigned to each piece of information and are visually displayed in the network visualization. The first level, evidence, is data stored in the central database with the highest credibility accessible by all investigators. The second level, knowledge, is a trusted information among the team of criminalists which occurred within the investigation and, and is not coming from the central database. The trustworthiness of this information is already so high that it is desirable to share it throughout the team. The third level, assumption, represents assumptions. It can exist only temporarily and is often poorly supported by evidence, but still it can show useful to include in the analysis. We represent these three levels by three signaling dots that always appear alongside data elements. In the second part of the presentation, we look at how criminalists work with the network visualization and time 
and how we can better support their exploratory process. Criminalists work under heavy pressure. They investigate cases with different time spans. Sometimes they need to come up with a decision within hours, while other times the case may spread over several years. This poses substantial demands on their cognitive capacity and memory load, especially as they need to work with multiple hypotheses, often simultaneously. Therefore, it is important for them to have the possibility to track their explorative process. Within our collaboration, we first identified requirements for exploratory process, among which are support for nonlinear exploration, comparison and combination of exploration paths, and non-intrusive collaboration. Let's have a look at these requirements and our proposed solutions in detail. The most important requirement is the support for nonlinear exploration. While there are solutions that allow exploration and tracking in form of provenance graph, such as knowledge pearls, they only allow to track users' interactions, such as clicks or zooms. However, in this approach, the thinking that leads to individual interactions with the system is not stored. To track the criminalized exploratory process, it is important to store the thinking and decisions behind visualization states rather than the interactions that led to them. Let's have a look at our solutions. Once users come to an interesting view on data, they may want to store the current state of the analysis. The key feature of Vesaland is instrumentalization of this process. The users can create multiple states of network visualization and organize them into branches that reflect the natural divergence of thinking. Users can annotate the states and branches with their thoughts, tasks or hypothesis statements. Such externalization reduces the cognitive load and allows users to keep track of the whole investigation process while analyzing individual paths of exploration. The progress tracking diagram keeps the overview of the whole analytical process. Users can browse and revisit the states along with their annotations in the progress tracking view. The second requirement we identified is the combination of exploration paths. As individual exploration paths can answer different questions, these can contain relevant information or useful views on data that criminalists may want to compare and combine. Therefore, Visalan provides a comparison mode, enabling site-to-site -site comparison of two selected states. The site panel allows to see details of respective states, supported by link highlighting in all views. The site panel also shows an overview of the commonalities and differences in these graphs, categorized by their type. Once they find some elements of the network crucial for the investigation, or simply true, they have the possibility to propagate them to other branches using the merge operation. The merge operation turns the two selected states into a new one according to user settings and preferences. Now that we've seen the design of process tracking, let's see its application to criminal investigation. What we've talked about so far was a case when a criminalist uses Visalan to generate multiple hypotheses and to study them while keeping track of the whole investigation process. Visalan also supports collaboration in a team by allowing to share a single branch or a whole exploration graph with a colleague. As the mode of collaboration needs to be designed in such a way that criminalists cannot interfere with work of their colleagues and influence their work in progress, it is possible to either share exploration paths in a read-only mode or to duplicate it into their workspace. In the same way, criminalists can import exploration paths to other investigations. For instance, when a suspect was already involved in a past case, this can help to rediscover patterns that were revealed in previous cases and thus can lead to knowledge reuse among cases. Of course, only when the access is granted. Our designs are implemented in Visiland, a web-based application. Visiland is a part of Bigger Research Project which develops a framework for supporting criminal investigations. Besides Visiland, the framework consists of data storage, modules for data transformations, and special data analysis, such as similarity search or face recognition. Let's have a look at Visiland in detail. It consists of four main views interacting by link together. The overview dashboard as the main page, the network analysis view used by the analysts to investigate cases, progress tracking diagram to capture and browse different states of investigation, and the report viewer to summarize the investigation's outcome. 
The usability of Busyland was evaluated within two qualitative studies conducted with two experts in criminology, one of whom is the head of the criminal intelligence analysis in the National Law Enforcement of Czech Republic. The first evaluation was conducted online due to the COVID-19 outbreak. The next round of evaluation was in person with the above-mentioned experts. Generally, the experts highly appreciated that Visaland targets the bottlenecks in their daily workflow and they expressed the desire to test Visaland on a variety of their cases. They especially appreciated the possibility to track the history of the investigation by creating branches in the progress tracking diagram. They also confirmed that the free level credibility design exactly reflects their needs. The session also revealed several interesting areas we plan to address in the future, such as wider support for handling hypotheses or extending the tool with geotemporal visualizations. As the project is carried out in collaboration also with the head of the Criminal Intelligence Analysis Department, the tool is intended to be used in the future by the investigation forces of Czech Republic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the interesting talk, Christy. So we have a uh, couple of questions. Um, so first question regarding um, is in regards to the analysts that she worked with. So were these analysts users of existing commercial tools like Analyst Notebook or Palantir? Uh, yes, thanks for the question. So uh, yeah, we work with a team that actually uses IBM's Analyst Notebook and we use that as a starting point for our analysis of the requirements for this tool. And I would like to mention that especially one step that like made us work on this uh, on this project is that how they use is that they would like make a lot of copies of the analyst notebook document and then would like get easily lost in them and we tried to help with this like major problem they had so they are pretty familiar with them and uh, we of course like adopted the things that they were like satisfied with from the professional tools into our system as well Got it. So I have a question regarding the sort of, um, I would almost think about it as like semantic providence as the users, you know, interact with the visualization to annotate explicitly what they're finding. Um, I was wondering if um, through your user studies, did you look to see whether one person's sort of understanding of the visualization and their, how they annotated it and what they found, did it make sense to others? Did it allow for collaboration? Uh, yeah, so uh, that, yeah, that's an interesting question because uh, we did not specifically test this part, but uh, we kind of hope that like giving the analyst space to uh, explore the, the data in their own way and then like sitting one next to each other and maybe explaining the steps. So, so we kind of count it into like this in-person sharing of their, of their way of exploration would uh, be very useful, but we didn't really focus on uh, like then trying to understand one, like someone else's process of thinking, which I think is actually a very challenging thing to do. But we really hope actually that uh, like the use of the annotations can help uh, clarify also for themselves. And so, because sometimes they forget their individual steps. So it helps to clarify what was uh, happening at that point and what motivates them to take any other steps in the exploration. And one other uh, quick question. So um, you mentioned that there's a challenge of different time scales. So in your in your um, experiments and your user studies, did you explicitly look at scenarios where you know you had some like a short time scale, a long time scale, just to see sort of how robust the system was? Yeah, 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 definitely. So uh, that actually is reflected in our in our study and uh, was like one of the requirements since the beginning. And it showed that even when they work in a really short time span, it may seem that it's useless to use the system because they can, for example, work with just a few objects, but they said that it's really important for them to like write it down somewhere into this uh, analysis so they can use it in the future and maybe it can reveal patterns in other cases. So we focused for both on the short ones and the long-term ones. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, 
uh, moving on. Um, so our next presentation is titled ChemVA, Interactive Visual Analysis of Chemical Compound Similarity and Virtual Screening. And the talk will be given by Maria Virginia Savando and Pavel Uper. Welcome to the presentation of Kemba, an interactive tool for analyzing chemical compound similarity in virtual screening. My name is Virginia Savando, and together with Pavel Ulbrich, we will be presenting our collaborative project on behalf of all our co-authors from Universidad Nacional del Sur in Bahia Blanca, Argentina, and from Masaryk University in Brno, Czech Republic. Before presenting our proposed tool, let me start with the main motivation of our research. In the modern drug discovery process, virtual screening is a central task for finding new medicines. Virtual screening applies computational techniques for identifying chemical compounds with a desired bioactivity profile, such as being a good candidate for treating specific disease. During the drug discovery process, very large sets of potential drug candidates are obtained. These sets of compounds are often described by various features that need to be explored by the medicinal chemist. Here, visualization plays an important role, as it helps them to visually cluster and filter the compounds according to these features. Visualization tools for virtual screening help significantly reduce the amount of compounds that need to be verified in vitro, thus making the drug design process faster and cheaper. However, such tools face a number of challenges. One key aspect of virtual screening is assessing the similarity between chemical compounds. In order to achieve this goal, it is important to provide domain experts with a variety of features of the studied compounds that play a crucial role in determining molecular similarity. For example, only a small change in the atomistic constitution or the chirality of a compound can have a significant influence on their bioactivity, as it happens in the infamous case of thalidomide. Visualization tools should provide interactions with different sources of molecular information while providing complementary views that help find hints for similarity among compounds. On top of that, the views and layout of the tool should simplify the comparison of these sources of data without overwhelming the user with information. Virtual screening methods often work with high-dimensional vector-based abstractions of a given compound, such as SMILES formulas, molecular descriptors, or fingerprints. Working with these abstractions involves dealing with the typical challenges of high-dimensional data. They need to undergo a dimensionality reduction process in order to visualize them. However, applying two different DR techniques to the same dataset can yield two different projections. Moreover, two compounds that are actually similar might not be displaced close to each other in the DR projection. Since the domain experts use these projections to make decisions about the relationships between compounds, the visualization tool should provide information about the trustworthiness of these mappings in an interpretable way. The third challenge is related to the way the visualization methods handle data exploration. Molecular ensembles in virtual screening are large. Datasets can have from a couple hundreds to many thousands of compounds. A visualization tool for virtual screening should also provide views and interactions that allow the domain expert to explore the data efficiently and to derive conclusions about which of the features under study are actually related to the desired bioactivity profile. These issues were the main driving forms behind our research and, as a result, we introduced Canva an interactive system for visual exploration of chemical compounds that is targeted for visual screening. Canva provides domain experts with several linked views, combining a hexagonal view for the data overview, a detailed view which allows selection, 3D view displaying aligned compounds, and an interactive table view. Finally, we present a difference view for direct comparison of dataset projections. The core of Canva consists of 2D plots, which support the visual inspection of multiple molecular representations. It gives the user an overview of the distribution of compounds in a selected dimensional unity reduction projection using a given molecular representation. This overview is supported by the hexagonal view, a well-adopted and commonly used approach to visualize the outcome of dimensional unity reduction techniques. 
which also handles the overplotting problem. The user can interactively select a subset of hexagons of their interest and explore the distribution of individual data items within the detail view. The various chemical properties, both ordinal and categorical, are encoded by a color, and the opacity of the aggregated hexagons is representing a relative number of compounds it contains. Our newly proposed difference view is tailored to support the visual comparison of different projections. After selecting a group of hexagons on one projection, it displays where the compounds in those hexagons are in the second projection. It illustrates the composition of local neighborhoods, indicating stronger regions when the neighborhoods are preserved between projections and weaker ones when compounds grouped in one mapping appear scattered in the other one. Canva also incorporates a correlation encoding to the plots, which conveys the trustworthiness of a low-dimensional projection based on a distortion with regard to the pairwise distances between compounds in the original space. In other words, it shows how well is a compound positioned in a reduced 2D space. This encoding is directly incorporated into the difference view. The plots are accompanied by an interactive table view that allows for advanced sorting and filtering and shows detailed information about the compounds being displayed, focusing primarily on features related to drug likeliness. Canva also contains a 3D view that enables the user to explore the structural similarity among selected compounds. The view performs an alignment of selected compounds with respect to their maximum common substructure, which serve to identify commonalities and differences among them. Finally, Canva allows the user to load new compounds to the existing dataset, which enables to explore potential new drug candidates in the context of the dataset under study. The position of the newly added compounds are computed by a parametric model based on neural networks. Virginia will now show you a case study demonstrating the usefulness of our tool. Kemba was evaluated on two case studies, and here we present one of them. This case study is based on the serotonin-dopamine dataset, a set of compounds that has data about antagonistic activity against the serotonin and dopamine receptors. The goal of the study was to find molecular patterns that could indicate biological activity towards both receptors. After identifying groups of potentially similar compounds, the domain experts searched for groups of compounds that were active towards both receptors and that had desirable pharmacological properties, such as following the Lipinski rule of five. The domain expert used the Kendall and Pearson correlation color encoding in order to observe whether the projections were trustworthy and thus the hexagons being considered would effectively group similar compounds. The domain expert selected these compounds and performed a 3D alignment in the 3D view, finding that their structures are indeed very similar. The structures of active compounds towards both receptors were downloaded from Canva. Five new compounds were designed based on the information provided by Canva. These five compounds were loaded to Canva and compared with the dataset. The newly designed compounds were projected by Canva near the selected dataset compounds in the daylight projection, occupying the same hexagons, and slightly further from them in the fingerprints projection. The difference view was used to explore the redistribution of the selected regions from the daylight to the fingerprints projection. In addition to the domain expert in charge of the case studies, Canva was evaluated by two other domain experts and one visualization expert. In the case studies, Canva effectively guided the domain expert to design five new compounds that proved to be good candidates for the biological target and the study, which shows the potential of Canva for drug design. The experts claimed that Canva was intuitive, easy to understand and use. They also highlighted an uncommon but useful fact that the comparison of various properties at the same time would let them conduct tedious tasks faster and easier. According to the visualization expert, our newly proposed difference view enables the user to visualize how two different mappings are correlated in terms of grouping the same set of molecules together. 
Although Canva is a domain specific, it has been developed by applying techniques and strategies that would be suitable for non-chemical data, mostly considering that analyzing dimensionality reduction trustworthiness could be useful in many other domains. We also identified potential directions for future extensions of the tool. Following the suggestions made by the domain experts in charge of the evaluation, such as enabling the user to load and customize their own data and providing options for advanced search. For more details about Canva, please refer to our paper. Resources and supplementary materials, such as these slides, are publicly available on our GitHub repository. Feel free to contact us via email if you have any questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for the um, interesting talk. So we have time um, for a couple of questions. Um, so one question brought up um, was the um, design motivation for the hexagonal binning. Did you consider other alternatives for showing the dimensionally reduced data? Yeah, maybe I would be the one to answer this question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. This is an amazing question because uh, we are inspired by the bees. And by the way, they are handling, uh, like occupying the whole space. And in this fact, um, hexagons were proven to be the best way to uh, keep the, the most of the connectivity between the elements and also occupying the same space. Because in other way, we could use squares or triangles. But in this way, uh, we will be kept only with four-way or just three-way connectivity between uh, the selected regions, while we want to uh, kept as much as possible. So we selected hexagons as the, as the correct way for us. So in this way, if we are exploring like multiple of the regions and selecting them in the hexagonal view, uh, we can select like is better the, uh, the clusters that are kept there. And this way uh, it's, um, it was proven to be the most suitable uh, for our domain experts to use that. And actually, a follow-up question regarding that. Did you find that, um, was there any usability issues regarding the sort of sensitivity of binning? So you have to define a certain resolution, I'm assuming that for your hexagonal bins, and so if points that are you know, slightly perturbed from the boundaries of the bins, you may get a different color map. Did you find that that hindered the analysis at all? Yeah, <laughs> this was one of the things that was not shown in the video, uh, but the size of the hexagons can be changed. So there are like some restrictions and uh, there can be like from the very low number of the hexagons, for example, like from the, I don't know, 10 or 20 of them until in the lower hundreds of them. So in the end, for the smaller data sets, uh, there can be even one hexagon for, for a compound. Uh, but for the large data sets, the binning can be much, much more uh, like specified in this case. It, and so in your um, user studies, did were these parameters by default what the users ended up using or did they did you find that they tuned any of these parameters in their analysis? Did they find that they needed more resolution? Um, yeah, um, in this case, uh, I mean, uh, for the user, user studies, we tailored the views uh, for these data sets. So we used two data sets, uh, one was shown in the video, uh, while the second one was maybe tenfold larger. And um, the, the user experts uh, experimented with the resolution, uh, but the default bidding they found sufficient, especially uh, since they were exploring not only like predefined clusters, but also neighboring positioned compounds that were there. So uh, in the end, uh, it was like better for them to have uh, like larger hexagons. Uh, so they could observe also like neighboring ones so they were not limited by like predefined um, constraints of the clusters. Uh, we have time for one other question. So um, how many uh, chemical compounds were compared in the um, case studies that you considered? Well, I can take that one. Uh, thank you very much for the question. 
Um, so basically, we presented two case studies on our paper. Uh, the first one, that is the one that we show on the video presentation, is the serotonin dopamine data set that consists of around 250 compounds uh, after uh, filtering and the sanitization of the data set. And the second data set, which is a P-glycoprotein data set, uh, so it's ligands against a P-glycoprotein, uh, it's around uh, 900 compounds. Uh, and we chose these two in order to also visualize how the domain experts would handle the, and would be able to use these two with two different uh, sizes of data sets. But uh, we could potentially accommodate much larger data sets uh, because of these uh, specific functionalities, such as the change of the granularity in the hexagonal binning. Uh, so uh, according to the evaluation and the domain experts, um, the the tool could be used with larger data sets as well. Uh, thank you both for the interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. All right, uh, so moving along to our, our next talk in our session. So the next talk is entitled, A Visualization Framework for Multi-Scale Coherent Structures in taylor Coet Turbulence. And the talk will be given by Duong Nguyen. Hi, everyone. I'm Zoom Nguyen from University of Houston. And on behalf of my co-author, I'm here today to present our paper, A Visualization Framework for Multi-Scale Coherent Structure in Taylor Coep Turbulent. Let me start by introducing Taylor Coep Flow. For short, I will call it DC Flow. This is a turbulence fluid motion created between two concentric cylinders rotating with different speed. Uh, the two is the, the two cylinders can rotate in either the same or counter direction. DC flows is one of the most well-known phenomenon in fluid mechanics and exists in many real-world scenarios. Understanding the development of the hydrodynamics and pattern formation of the DC will have to design better, for example, bioreactor for drug development, heat exchanger in food industry, and oil drilling system. To better understand the flow, researchers try to simplify the setup and simulate it. For the simulation purpose, Taylor Coer flows can be described as the flow between two parallel planes which move with equal but opposite velocity. There are two important parameters for the TC uh, simulation. The first one is traditional Raynaud number. Uh, the second parameter is used to characterize the different uh, rotation of the cylinder. This is called uh, rotation number, R omega, in which uh, omega is a solid body rotation in the span y direction. For DC flow, what do fluid mechanic researchers typically look for? The most important feature that domain experts look for from the DC flows are coherent structures. Existing works have proved that Last scale coherent structure depend on the Raynaud number. In particular, if the Raynaud number exceeds a certain threshold, the flow becomes turbulent. The last scale acid symmetric toroidal vortexes called Taylor emerge. A sample configuration of Taylor vortex are demonstrated in this picture. Although the Taylor rows are in 3D, the detection of this structure mostly performed on a 2D cross section. One of the recent stuck Statistical Bay theories has demonstrated that the turbulence rows may reappear with a different rotation value. However, this is not trivial to evaluate the hypothesis visually. For example, as you can see here, we have isovolumes ejected from positive Q in the three simulations with different uh, rotation number. Q vorticity and other physical attributes are currently used by domain experts for the TC analysis because they are helpful for monitoring energy transportation. These ISO volume only highlight the small scale vortex and do not provide any indication about large scale structure. The goal of our project is to design a 3D visualization based framework that can separate the small versus large scale structure. And the, 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 the framework will try to utilize the physical attributes which uh, domain expert care about. So in the next couple of minutes, I will try my best to explain 
how our proposals framework can achieve the goal to separate the small versus large scale structure for the TC simulation like in this result. In terms of the existing work, there are many techniques in the literature to extract the coherent structure. The most prominent type, type of coherent structure are vortexes. For the vortex detection, we have two main approaches, the region-based and the light-based methods. Both groups of the methods are local and only good at the cap capturing the small-scale structure. FTRE is used to extract the Lagrangian coherent structure, but it does not provide any scale information. The top topology-based methods are popular for steady flow analysis, however, they do not work well with the turbulence flow. The non-topology-based methods like Fourier transform and uh, convolution kernels also have uh, some limitation. So we start looking at the standard methods which use a single attribute. We, we can select the value range obtained from stati statistical based methods and visualize um, using volume renderings. However, it can only perform well in the TC uh, flow with a high uh, cylinder rotation ratio. With lower rotation number, a single attribute cannot pick up the difference. As you can see in this example, we took 2D slide cut uh, of the single attribute Q. There are some large scale structure highlighted in the areas, but uh, the attribute do not provide a clear indication. Uh, in other hand, we can see a clear, clearer separation of the structure in the shear and uh, streamwide velocity. This observation motivates us to combine features in multiple attributes to better capture the prominent structure. To combine multiple attributes, we utilize the decent uh, feature level set methods, which is a, a, an extension of the isosurface extraction for multivariate attribute. From that, we come up with our pipeline for the problem. We first derive multiple attributes from the input velocity field. By analyzing the characteristics of the attributes and with the knowledge from the domain expert, we can select attributes and their corresponding value range that can partially indicate the existence of the large and small scale structure. To extract the structure in 3D, we adapt the feature level set uh, to combine features in multiple attributes. To achieve a smooth representation for the structure, we further apply a density estimation or the distant field obtained from the feature level set. Because uh, the tails are depicted by 2D planes constructed using the world normal and span y direction, uh, we also compute the 2D sum summary configuration of the vertexes in the DC. By projecting 3D information on the 2D planes, the result highlight the areas uh, with high concentration of the small scale and large scale structure. I will skip the detailed description about 2D visualization in this talk. If you are interested, please check out our paper. So let's go deeper into uh, our extension for the feature level set. Let's say we want to combine multiple attributes and feature in each attribute can extract using a set of a threshold range. For each point in the spatial domain, we also have a set of attribute values. The way that feature level sets work is to generate a distant value for each point in spatial domain. The distance represents how close that the point belongs to the feature defined in O attribute. So the distance will be zero if attribute values uh, belong to the corresponding value range. Otherwise, the feature level set distance will be the minimum of all distance between the attribute values uh, and the corresponding uh, threshold value. Once we compute the distance field, the stretch method is to extract the surface representation for the coherent structure is to apply isosurfacing. However, in practice, the distance field is not always smooth as so in this example. To overcome this issue, we adapt the uh, kernel density estimation 
to provide a pro approximation visualization for the structure. This is quite standard equation for density estimation. The idea is to map the distant value into a density field in which higher density value corresponding to the area contain containing more structure with a similar scale. We work with a fluid mechanics who is an uh, expert in the domain to evaluate our proposed pipeline on the three simulation with the different rotation number. With the rotation number R omega equal to 0 0.1, we are able to extract very clean separation of the small scale versus large scale structure using Q and velocity magnitude. In this sim simulation, the large scale structure are the trailer roll. We use streamline to verify the correctness of the extracted uh, uh, surface because uh, the streamline should wrap around the structure. We also visualize DC in the cylindrical uh, coordinates so that domain expert can have a more intuition about the original configuration. To quantitatively evaluate the result, we compute two covering percentage. The percentage of the large scale structure enclosed by the obtained surface and the percentage of the small scale structure enclosed by the uh, surface. The former actor acts as a true positive, while the latter is a false positive. Higher put higher true positive and lower false positive values are the better. For the R omega equal to 0 0.5, we use streamwide velocity and the shear attribute. With this rotation number, it is hard to observe clean Taylor vortexes. Our method is still able to capture some uh, large structure that behaves like the trailer roll. Uh, this result further strengthens the new theory that I mentioned earlier, which is the trailer rolls may reappear with a different rotation number. To demonstrate the advantage of our framework over traditional methods that usually perform smoothing to remove small scale feature, we compare our result with the convolution kernel approach. The area highlighted by a blue circle indicate that the convolution kernel still pick up a lot of small scale structure, whilst our methods here is able to separate them. When the rotation number in minimums are omega equal to zero, this is the most chaotic scenario in which uh, there are no existing method that can effectively isolate the large scale structure from the small ones. Although our methods do not completely overcome this challenge, the ejector surface also partially reveal the shape and position of the structure that the expert hypothesized. To summarize, we propose a first 3D visualization based framework that can effectively separate the small versus large scale structure in Taylor Square flows. The main limitation of the methods is that the qualities of the structure depend on the threshold section of the attribute. In addition, uh, the extracted surface are just approximation of the region where the structure resides. This is not the precise uh, surface. We plan to address the issue in the future work. Uh, thank you for listening.
Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. So um, we have time for a quick question. Um, so I was curious, I mean, you mentioned this at the end of your talk that you have to specify these attribute ranges as part of your method. How sensitive is your method to the setting of the attribute ranges when you're driving your distance? Yeah, so actually it's, it's, uh, it's quite sen uh, sensitive, but uh, again, we use a KDE, so it's kind of like grouping. So uh, uh, the, the position of the structure, I mean, should be uh, 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 not too sensitive to value, but the shape of the structure should uh, be sensitive to the, 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 the uh, attribute values. Yeah, and mostly the attribute values is um, the getting from the uh, from already like uh, public work based on the stat statistical based uh, values. So yeah, uh, we, we got very kind of like a good yeah a value for the settings. Right. Mm. Actually, and one other quick question: you mentioned earlier in your talk um, that the FTLA so um, or the FTLE excuse me yeah. doesn't require. Um, or doesn't capture any notion of scale, but there's a notion of time in it, right? In terms of how long you integrate. So I was wondering whether something like FTLE, you know, could you use that as a way to capture multiple scales by just varying the um, time along which you integrate? I don't think so, because uh, so when we have the scales mean like we have the shape, right? The shape and the time. So FTLE is mostly provide a um, uh, 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 the time information, like how long and how how, how short you want to uh, compute the FTLE. And when we talk about the scale, we talk about mo about both the shape and the time. So yeah, I think that's the reason the FTLE doesn't uh, work with our case. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the talk. Yeah. And, thank you. Um, yeah. So moving on to our last talk of the session. So the, our last talk is entitled conceptual model of visual analytics for hands-on cybersecurity training. And it will be presented by Radek Oslezek. Hello. Cybersecurity training is about solving practical cybersecurity tasks in computer networks. Uh, in general, hands-on exercises train higher order thinking and problem solving which is also similar goal to programming courses, for instance. But there is one big difference. Cybersecurity is process oriented. The goal of trainees is, for example, uh, to scan computer network, uh, exploit the vulnerability, uh, or to uh, repeal a cyber attack. Uh, we have no tangible output like code that would be assessed or analyzed. Therefore, it's difficult to check the progress of trainees or uh, identified trainees being in troubles during the exercise. And here, uh, visual analytics can significantly help. However, it's a quite new application domain. Nobody know where exactly and how the visualizations can help. Of course, there exist specific uh, visualizations for particular tasks, but uh, the global view of the state of this domain was missing. So, we uh, try to map this state and provide generic guidelines for visualizations in this domain. Uh, well, the first step was uh, the unification of cybersecurity training programs. Uh, there is plenty of diverse uh, approaches used worldwide to train uh, practical cybersecurity. Uh, we noticed that every training, regard regardless of its type, consists of three basic phases. First, uh, the training has to be somehow designed and prepared during so-called planning phase. Uh, then it's organized. We say that uh, the training is executed and then uh, the results are used for reflection. Uh, reflection is important for both uh, trainees to learn from their mistakes and for organizers to continuously improve uh, the impact of future training sessions. Uh, other people involved in these phases significantly differ uh, across uh, various training programs. 
uh, we were able to classify them into several distinct rows. However, as you can see, these rows are not completely independent, uh, they form a hierarchy. Uh, besides trainees, who are the primary subjects of training programs, of course, uh, there, are, uh, there is a lot of other people involved in uh, uh, the organization of training sessions. Usually, uh, there are tutors or judges who supervise the training session. Uh, there can be sparring partners of trainees like attackers. Uh, and because training sessions are usually organized in complex distributed environments, referred to as cyber ranges, then uh, there can be also uh, operator of such cyber ranges involved in uh, the analysis of the data. Uh, all these participants can somehow benefit from the analysis of training, but not only direct money, uh, participants of the training uh, sessions are interested in the data. Uh, another important group are designers of training programs who uh, invent the training content and who want to learn how much training fulfilled their expectations. So, having such classification of user roles, we could use them as personas for uh, the specification of visual analytic uh, approaches. <clears throat> Putting together the life cycle, uh, user roles and data available in different phases, we were able to define areas where visualization techniques can help. Uh, the classification is hierarchical uh, at the top level, we distinguish between uh, vi visualizations for uh, situational awareness and post-training visual data analysis. Uh, in general, design rules for situational awareness are very specific because uh, they have to reflect the fact that uh, they are used at runtime and they serve like uh, monitoring tools for rapid decision making. On the contrary, post-training analysis uh, is used for uh, the retrieval of, uh, let's say, deeper inferred knowledge. Uh, the second level uh, divides visualizations according to specific visualization goals of involved user roles. Uh, trainees need to know current state of the exercise and get insight into the cybersecurity processes. They ask questions like, is my server accessible for users or did I protect a host successfully? Corresponding visualizations tend to be uh, demonstrative. Uh, they should provide identification of semantics of network hosts, state of links and other uh, like storytelling features. Uh, organizing participants, uh, especially tutors who supervise the training, have to know the state of the training session whether there are some students stuck in some task uh, and so on. Uh, supporting visualizations have to be easy to decode uh, because supervisors have to uh, pay attention primarily to participants and they have to provide an overview uh, of uh, the training session with uh, the identification of possible troubles so that supervisors can uh, intervene in time. Uh, from the learning point of view, very important is a person-centered feedback provided to trainees just after the training uh, and enabling them to become aware of uh, their mistakes or suboptimal steps performed in solving tasks. Uh, similarly, supervisors want typically learn to, uh, how they perform during the training, whether they intervened in time and so on. Therefore, uh, retrospective person-centered views uh, of the training development and results are necessary. Uh, continuous improvement of training programs are, uh, and increasing the impact of training on learners uh, is the ultimate goal for any long-term education. Uh, training designers should analyze whether there are some flows in the tasks, uh, study and compare difficulty of training programs and so on. Uh, there is not much done uh, in this area and we consider this topic very important and interesting. Uh, data captured during the training can be also, uh, or 
used to learn something uh, about uh, the behavior of trainees. For example, uh, how much members of team cooperated and how it uh, affected final results. Again, this is a quite open and very interesting area where behavioral and process models could be supported by analytical visualizations. And we already started to tackle this topic. Uh, the last category is a bit special because it's related to the infrastructure in which training prog programs are uh, realized. Uh, as cyber ranges are very complex, unreliable, and their operation is costly, it's vital to analyze their features and bottlenecks uh, from data collected uh, during the training sessions. Okay. Uh, what I have presented were just uh, examples. In the paper, we described the third level that uh, represents even a finer grained categorization of analytical tasks. Uh, for each of these low level category, we define the roles that can benefit from uh, visualization, uh, their analytical goals. We discuss use cases, uh, constraints, uh, or requirements reflecting possible visual, visual analytics approaches. Uh, we have enough space uh, here to explain them all, but I can provide at least one example for personal reflection on trainees. Uh, in this particular category, we specify that uh, the utilization of this kind of analytical visualizations is just after the exercise, when trainees still remember details of uh, their behavior, uh, made decisions and conducted actions. and Providing this feedback as soon as possible means that the analytical visualizations have to be generated automatically from data. Uh, in all categories, we provide examples of analytical hypotheses. In this case, uh, is that trainees are typically wonder what they did wrong in particular task, where they lost most points and why, or how they performed compared to other trainees. We also aim to summarize current state and emphasize design rules or similar like takeaway messages that uh, would be useful when designing new visualization tools. Here, uh, the obvious uh, feedback has just the form of simple scoreboard uh, or limited uh, informal comments uh, prepared by supervisors. And we claim that uh, more valuable visual feedback should be person-centered, providing view of trainee's behavior during the training session and comparing his or her behavior with other players. Uh, it, has to, uh, it has to be easy to use because uh, the exercise is often exhaustive and uh, even after such exhaustive training, the participants should be still willing to and motivated to uh, interact with the visualization and learn even more from the exercise. Uh, we provide examples of existing visualizations, uh, if some exist, of course, but in general, as this is quite new application domain and the most of the categories that I presented uh, here are either not covered at all or uh, only basic or very uh, specific cases are covered and there is definitely a huge space for further research. Uh, to conclude, our conceptual model can serve as a framework providing a basic guidelines for uh, the development of analytical visualizations for various fields of cybersecurity training. Thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions.
doing this. Okay, thank you for the interesting talk, Greta. So we have uh, time for a question. So, um, so it appears that um, so the sort of this space that you characterized um, might have at a glance appear to be a bit prescriptive. So, how much creativity is there from the domain experts in coming up with solutions that you can use for training? Um, you know, it's. Uh... It's quite new application domain because uh, the development of cyber ranges where uh, the practical cybersecurity training can be organized is, is uh, the matter of uh, the last decade. Uh, and uh, when uh, this particular training uh, started to be organized, then uh, just the organizers uh, meet a lot of obstacles because they really don't know what's happening during the training and, and uh, they don't know what was the effect of, of the training or, or, or impact on, 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 the, on, the, on the students. So uh, we collaborate, uh, we, we benefit from the uh, long term experience with the developing of such a cyber range and we organize these, uh, these uh, trainings and we tightly cooperate with, with people that, that, uh, that design these games and, and training programs. And uh, there is uh, really a lot of space for, for uh, providing learning analytics and especially visual visual analytics for these learning uh, learning uh, goals. Okay. All right. Well, um, so I believe that concludes um, this session. So let's thank all of our speakers for the very interesting talks. Thanks, everybody. We present Responsive Matrix Cells, a focus on context approach for exploring and editing multivariate graphs. For a matrix visualization encoding both adjacency and node similarity, we propose to embed responsive visualizations in these cells. These visualizations can not only detail the aggregated value of a single cell, but also represent multivariate or structural aspects for a group of cells and even allow for editing values. Political debates are a rare opportunity for voters to learn valuable information about candidates and their stances on important issues, but they can also be inaccessible for casual, non-expert users. Through a two-year design study in collaboration with political scientists and journalists, we created a novel task analysis for exploring transcripts as a casual user and developed DebateViz, an interactive tool for visualizing political debates for casual, non-expert users. Comparative layout are the visualization arrangement to support visual comparison tasks. To better understand them, we conducted a systemic survey on 127 research papers. Based on the survey, we suggest a lucid classification, as well as diverse practical implications that help you better design comparative visualizations. 
Find out more in our presentation. Generating a stacking ensemble of models is usually a complicated trial and error process. In order to deliver the best and most diverse stacks to the user, we propose StackGenVis, a visual analytic system that supports an iterative process. With different algorithms and quality metrics, instance and feature selection, model optimization, and more. We propose to adapt the tangible brush 3D selection technique to augmented reality. While augmented reality has benefits for volumetric visualization and selection, a naive implementation possesses limitations regarding the user's physical position and the physical size of the tablet. We thus discussed the pros and cons of different mappings for the position of the tablet. We considered its absolute position and its relative motions. We propose a novel vision analytics system for optimizing bus networks. The system helps users first analyze bus network performance and identify problematic routes. Then, the alternative to a selected routes can be obtained in real time. By evaluating these routes with our system, the users can efficiently decide which one is the best and improve the bus network. Ensuring the usability of our dataset is often tied to data wrangling. We can use provenance to log the employed steps, but these alone will not give us meaningful insights if data quality was improved. We propose to incorporate data quality metrics into the provenance model. The enhanced provenance graph can be visualized to show the development of quality throughout the wrangling process. To find out more about the visualization design and the results of our evaluation, please join us during the live presentation and discussion session. Approximately 100,000 cases of head and neck cancer are diagnosed in the U.S. annually. Patients are increasingly likely to survive, but often experience acute and long-term side effects. Hence, great importance has been placed on improving patients' quality of life and inducing symptom burden during treatment. Using novel visual encodings, we introduce an interactive system which enables clinicians to assess medical data, providing context for new patients based on clinical features and symptom evolution over time. Our paper describes the motivation, ideation, and prototyping of a novel visualization tool to support voice training for transgender people. We centered our design around user needs and lived experiences in order to support self-determination of gender expression. In so doing, we make novel inroads in how to visualize speech data and open possibilities for future work in the design of visualizations that prioritize user agency. In this study, we designed PassVisor to fully analyze the passing dynamics. Users can hover on a pattern diagram to see all the passing patterns, it is the characteristics, and how these patterns distributed over phases. They can further click on a pattern to see its phases, select one phase to see the passing, and inspect the prior statistics during passing. Our prior work has examined how visualization impacts decision making. There is no concrete method for quantifying and comparing the impact of different encodings on decisions. We rethink how we evaluate decision making with visualizations by leveraging work from economic theory. We present the results of a large scale lottery game that evaluates the impact of five different visualization designs on risk behavior and decision making. When NASA engineers plan a mission, they turn to space trajectory designers to chart a path that minimizes the need for propellant mass. In this work, we apply the topological analysis of the circular restricted three-body problem to space trajectory design. And demonstrate the benefit of this approach to devise compelling solutions to realistic trajectory design problems. MeetQs is an interactive visual platform which augments existing tools for meetings with features that help people engage and reflect. Its visualization shows if more people are satisfied or uncertain about the contents of a meeting. Attendees can add comments and upvote others' comments. Attendees can reflect on the contents and what happened during the meeting 
using the summary page sent after it is over. How to know if a graph is correctly drawn? Are all the aesthetic properties preserved? To answer these questions, we currently use quantitative methods that require graph structure and are computationally expensive. We propose a new method that to directly compute these metrics from graph layout images using convolutional neural networks. Below are the results. To know more about our approach, please attend our talk. Usual collaborative systems propose a public and private environment the latest possessing visibility rights. Subjective views are special objects perceived differently per user. However, a break in the social space may happen during exploration. Our visualization context strives to link efficiently multiple relative visualizations together around a common object. We discussed about the designs of a stacking layout, virtual leaking layout, and a mix between them. Kirigami is a rich, complex Japanese tradition of paper cutting. We leverage Kirigami to create new physical data representation and simple interaction. This is an example which shows global warming in five countries. The expansion shows mean temperature in each country in 1962. The user can manipulate the model by adding measure weights, and the increased expansion shows the mean temperature in 2012. Data journalists are a compelling group through which to study data wrangling because they frequently publish their methods to sites such as GitHub. In Table Scraps, we perform a qualitative study of their codes and computational notebooks to better understand the needs and pain points of journalists while data wrangling. From this data, we produce two taxonomies of computational journalism and a framework for multi-table data wrangling, and demonstrate these contributions through two case studies. We propose a novel vision analytics system for optimizing bus networks. The system helps users first analyze bus network performance and identify problematic routes. Then, the alternative to a selected routes can be obtained in real time. By evaluating these routes with our system, the users can efficiently decide which one is the best and improve the bus network. Virtualizations don't have to be static. In fact, sometimes it is the virtualization that is static, and the viewer is moving. And sometimes, both of them move. We present a first design space of virtualizations in motion. An implementation of this design space. And we are working on a user study. As word clouds grow bigger and words get pushed into the periphery, viewers are less able to accurately compare data, font size for example, associated with each word. This indicates that large distances between words detract from a reader's ability to extract data from the word cloud, but that this bias goes away with the longer periods of reader perusal, suggesting perusal time being an important consideration for design.
When doing the cell division for an embryo, plant biologists use several tools to get a segmented 3D data set and build the hierarchy chain manually by traversing and analyzing neighboring cells and deciding on which neighbor is the sister based on their knowledge. In this poster, we present an interactive system for biologists to help with analyzing the development of plant embryo. Capturing analytic provenance is important for refining sense-making analysis. However, understanding this provenance can be difficult in distributed collaborations. We present a novel concept, crowd auditing, as a way to help debug distributed sense-making. We implemented the concept in a system called CrowdTrace that visualizes and traces the analysis provenance and elicit feedback to improve the analysis. We present an investigation into design judgment in DataViz practice. Our findings show how different types of judgments influence design decision making. Our findings also show that judgments occur in complex and layered ways while designers move through their process. We discuss implications for future research and pedagogy. Typically, black hole visualization takes a lot of compute time, but we achieve a quite faithful reproduction at interactive rates on a standard computer. For this, we make use of a novel adaptive grid approach to focus calculations where needed. Coupled with filtering and interpolation methods, we can obtain high quality imagery. Our approach accepts star catalogs and environment maps and generates the resulting deformations in real time. This paper explores the efficacy of using narratives as a medium of explaining the causality in causal networks. Now, towards this end, we provide you a glimpse of CauseWorks, a causality visualization system for generating narratives given a set of interventions and objectives for a causal model. And we further validate CauseWorks through interviews with experts. Please read our paper to know more. Thank you.
Color plus maps are popular. However, we have better encodings for numeric values. Check out the prism map. Worry about occlusion and perspective distortion? Let's go immersive. Want to have both of them? We present tilt map, a novel interaction technique for transitioning from a color plus map to a prism map to a bar chart to overcome the limitations of each. Believe me, tilt map opens up many research possibilities. Existing visualization tools for deep learning classification are mostly working on natural images with mutually exclusive classes. The classification of X-ray scattering images is more challenging since their multiple structural attributes have complex relationships. So, we built an effective visualization system to study the model performance and to find questionable labels or outlier images for scientists' further improvement. Table cartograms are a recent form of data visualization that embed tabular data in a grid of quadrilaterals, like a heat map that has been aerated rather than colored. There are lots of different valid outputs for a single input table. Unfortunately, algorithms found in prior work prevent exploration of this design space. We present a web-ready algorithm for creating table cartograms using an optimization-based approach that supports a wide variety of outputs and aesthetics. Find out more at this address or come by our poster. Nowadays, technology is developed for a single audience, assuming that one size fits all. Nevertheless, we all have individual differences, such as personality. Taking into account how personality affects preferences, we study whether it has an effect on hierarchy, evolution over time, and comparison context regarding information visualization. We leverage all personality variables from the five-factor model and the locus of control with correlation and clustering approaches, showing promising results.